This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, May 21st from Sarasota, Florida. I'm Seth Johnson. Welcome to the Home Tech Podcast, a podcast all about home automation and home technologies. Uh, I've been gone for like a week and uh, was spending time in beautiful state of North Carolina when all of a sudden we were standing around and realized you had no gas. You can't get any gas. Like there was, there was nowhere to buy gas. Uh, I was driving by this gas station and noticed a, a large line and uh, it turns out uh, there was a gas shortage. I, I made the news. I'm sure many of you saw it. Uh, people were filling up their gas cans and gas shopping bags, I guess. I don't know. I saw some crazy videos. Uh, anyway, yeah, we were we were stuck. We were on a road trip and we were stuck in North Carolina, which wasn't bad. Uh, had a great week there. Uh, it allowed, you know, instead of running around and, and trying to, to do all sorts of stuff, we were able to to go around and, and, and just like live at a cabin for a week. And then uh, basically from there, uh, we were able to to basically just like go out to little parks that were kind of around the house or the cabin we were staying in and, and do stuff there, like make fires, roast marshmallows, that kind of thing. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, what a relaxing week. Uh, but I did miss out on a bunch of home tech headlines. So uh, why don't we just jump right into that? Well, big news last week. And actually, while I was while I was camping, got a text message sent over to me from somebody and said, hey, Snappy V is going public. So uh, the big headline here, Wirepath Systems LLC doing business as Snappy V has announced that its parent company, this is kind of convoluted there, has confidentially submitted a draft registration uh, for its public op- uh, to uh, for the public offering of their common stock. Uh, they, they submitted the S1 uh, form to the Security Exchange Commission or the SEC and uh, they're proposing a uh, public offering on the company's common stock. should be interesting. Uh, Snap AV has been around since 2005. It was started by an integrator in the in the industry. Called, uh, his name was Jay Faison, I believe. Uh, he realized uh, pretty quickly that there was a way to buy stuff from China, uh, kind of the commodity products that we have, uh, and that he could buy them more profitably and efficiently from China in bulk and then use them in his own business. Uh, but also resell them to other custom integrators. Uh, that that basically started Snap AV. Uh, I think really the biggest hit, and I will I will die on this hill. <laughs> Snap AV uh, made a website that you could order things from, and believe it or not, in the year 2005, 2006, 2007, I was still sending off purchase orders and fax, you know, to the faxing things over to my distributors to buy things. So buying off of a website was fairly uncommon, especially one that would, you know, you could buy something and they'd give you a shipping update pretty quickly. They'd give you tracking information. Um, all of this has existed for many people for a very long time for our industry. It did not. And uh, they kind of revolutionized that and kind of set the, the standard and set the bar a little bit higher. I sold the company to General Atlantic in 2013, and that was sold over to h and which is Hellman and Friedman, I believe. Uh, it was a private equity company back in 2017, so they've been in their hands for a while. Uh, in, I mean, in those 10, 10, 20 years, they've developed episode speakers, Wirepath, uh, which is wire, I guess, uh, Binary, which is the HDMI video audio distribution brand inside, Strong, I think it's mounts and uh, racks, racking equipment. Triad, uh, which is actually Triad came along with the Control 4 acquisition, but that's some more speakers. Luma, that's the rebranded Hikvision stuff, but still good security security camera systems to use. Wattbox, uh, their in-house power and UPS stuff. Uh, PackEdge, which also came from Control 4 as well. Uh, Dragonfly, which is screens. I remember... In the back in the day, they would ship you a screen for free to try out. That's a long time ago. Uh, Arachnus, which is their networking gear, and Oversee, uh, which is kind of their uh, remote monitoring software that has been uh, <laughs> in, implemented in, in all of their all of their in-house product, electronic gear and product. Um, so, as I mentioned, they they made some acquisitions acquisitions over the years. Uh, Autonomic, which is no longer part of the company, they've been sold back out of the company. But uh, Sunbright TV was picked up a number of years back. Vigilant, I actually knew Adrian way back in the day. He and I both started our 
well, we, we both met each other at Claire Controls. So when he left there, he started Vigilant up and Vigilant was snapped up by Snap AV. They, they've been on a tear buying distributors over the last couple of years. Uh, all net MRI volume tune custom plus distri- distributing uh, this give them a pretty big footprint here in the states and then, of course they ship worldwide as well they have uh, offices in many other countries uh, through EME- EMEA and around the world um, and then of course they in 2019 they bought Control Four for two th- uh, 680 million dollars and brought Control Four out of being a public company and and into being a uh, back into a private company which is quite interesting. And a couple of weeks back, they bought Access Networks, which is still kind of the head scratcher of all this. But, you know, we'll leave that back. <laughs> I'm still not sure. I'll actually, I'll put a uh, Snap EV explains why it bought Access Networks story from CE Pro in the show notes. And you can go read through that and see if you can glean anything from it. I skimmed it and didn't get very much out of it. So still not sure why they bought that. But um, bigger questions for me would be, first off, what, what, is, this, what is the stock sim- ticker symbol going to be? They can't get Snap. That's taken. Wire is taken for Wire Path, I guess. Um, so yeah, uh, Wire is like oh, I forget the name of the company. It's a wire wire company to make copper wire. Snap, of course, is uh, Snapchat. <laughs> They're not going to get that one. Uh, so what is their four letter symbol going to be? Uh, unless they go in with like Oversee, I I'm really I'm really not sure what it's going to be. Like what? And do they change the name of the company? Really, really not sure. Um, so Eddie saying in the in, in the chat. Hey, I really want that stock. <laughs> yeah, it might, might not be too bad. Um, the next thing is, uh, I, I, my question on this is, is what will the store and company look like once they go p- full public here? Um, Wall Street is going to expect growth out of this company, and they're not going to get growth in the walled garden that they've purchased everybody in now. We've got no other customers to sell to. So I, I, I think, and I've been hearing rumors that they are planning as part of this is to opening up their store to the public and open up the, the, the catalog and the, the private brands that I mentioned above uh, to be sold to the public. So <laughs> Greg is, Greg is uh, suggesting that they use OOSK, which is out of stock, <laughs> which man, that is, it's rough right now buying any electronic gear, but yeah, I, that, that would be a funny one. Uh, but probably not one that uh, Wall Street would would appreciate very much. But um, yeah, back to their store. Uh, I, I I really think that the only way they're going to be able to show Wall Street the growth that they're looking for is to open up their brands to public and sell, you know, at retail pricing, Snap AV retail pricing um, to the public and, and make those products available online. And that kind of puts them in, I don't know, it kind of puts them in competition with uh, maybe like mono price. I don't know. They, 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 they would still have an immense amount of markup in something that's sold online rather than through distribution. So I don't know, is the money there, uh, to do something like that? It's questionable. Um, we'll have to see, we'll have to see where it goes. I, I, I did hear a couple of rumors that that's what they were looking to do. Uh, so we'll have to, it's one of those things we'll, we'll, we'll definitely have to, to wait and see. So I got a couple of stories about, uh, this, this one kind of hit as I left and walked out the door, but a Belgian security researcher who is known for pointing out faults in Wi-Fi security has discovered yet another vulnerability. Uh, this time, it's known as uh, a series of attacks that are called frag attacks, and they're believed to be pretty widespread and stem way back from the Wi-Fi standard, dating back to like 1997. So this is probably in, if you have Wi-Fi in your house, these, these defects are probably in there unless you've gotten an update anytime soon. Um, if exploited, the vulnerabilities would allow an attacker, an attacker within radio range to steal user information, attack devices, change the DNS, you know, all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, but the chances of the flaws, according to the uh, researcher, uh, being abused should be very low um, as it requires user, user interaction or some weird network settings. So um, on, the, on, the, on the risk level, uh, the, it's pretty low, uh, you know, public Wi-Fi, things that don't get updated all the time, maybe something to keep an eye on. Uh, and also, you know, update your, uh, your, your firmware on your devices as they become available. There's no evidence out there, uh, according to anybody that it, it, this is being used in the wire, uh, uh, used in the wild right now. So it, you know, when the updates do uh, come through, go ahead and get those updated. So some uh, interesting news out of Eufy. Uh, 9, to fa- 9 to 5 Mac first reported that a huge Eufy, 
privacy breach has had resulted in both live and recorded cameras uh, being shown to complete strangers in uh, the, Eufy an- the Anchor Eufy accounts. Uh, so the bug also sh- allows for complete access to the account, including control of the pan tilt zoom ca- or pan tilt cameras. Um, kind of a weird situation here that happened. And it was kind of over and done with fairly quickly. And I think it was because of the way that Eufy reacted to this. Um, here, here's what they had to say. Due to a software bug during the latest server upgrade, starting at 4.50 a.m. Eastern, a limited number... And it turns out only 712 customers um, were able to access video feeds from other users' cameras. Our engineering team recognized this issue at around 5.30, so about a couple minutes later, and quickly got it fixed by 6.30 a.m. So you know, about an hour and a half later, everything was all good to go. No more issues. This affected, like I said, 712 customers in the United States, New Zealand, Australia, Cuba, Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, Argentina. Wow, I don't know where that came from. Uh, and users across Europe remained unaffected. Um, sounded like this was a bad server update that was deployed out. And you know, so so early in the morning started affecting people who were awake at that point in time and kind of using their product. Uh, so I've, I've always said these types of things are excusable. Uh, software is written by humans. It can only be tested so much by humans. When you put something in production um, in front of millions of people, bugs just appear. You just don't know why. Um, So those things are going to happen. What's important here is how a company reacts to these issues. And the Eufy did a a great job here. I mean, they recognized it was an issue, uh, whether their engineers were surfing on Reddit or 9to5Mac or whatever and found found this or just kind of caught it off guard, caught it immediately um, to only have, you know, 0.001% of their customers affected. uh, It's pretty good. I mean, there's, there's really, there's really nothing that nothing more you can say about that. There's, there's a couple of other follow-ups that they had that they're going to um, apply for some kind of like uh, certifications, like outside audits basically. Uh, and they have updated some of their practices on how f- their infrastructure gets upgraded. Maybe updating their infrastructure would help as well. I, I don't know. This, like I said, mistakes were made, uh, but you know, no big deal because uh you know, it's how they react. If this had gone on for a week or two and there was no comment from the company, different, different story completely. So, all right. The Zigbee Alliance announced an organizational rebrand with the company shifting names uh, to be called the Connectivity Standards Alliance or CSA. In addition, the organization announced a rebrand for the project called Connected Home Over IP, CHIP, as we've been calling it. I think everybody's been calling on the show. Now that's going to be called Matter. So that's the customer-facing name of Chip, a connected over home over IP project that has been in the news all over the place uh, for the past you know year year two now I think uh, just because the big players are all involved Apple Google Samsung everybody huge Amazon everybody is involved with this thing and they're trying to make a one unified standard on basically how to set up a, and control a system and if it works. It would matter, but as Greg points out in the chat, it doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't doesn't matter. <laughs> it's kind of kind of my thoughts on on the whole thing. Um, we'll see if it does. I don't, I'm, I'm not not too hopeful uh, that it, that it that it will. So um, one thing I that popped up in, while I was reading things on vacation is this link from uh, from Nilay Patel over at the Verge. He posted a review on the SpaceX Starlink. Uh, that, a system that he's been testing. And uh, the review isn't all that great. <laughs> um, but he does admit, all right, so let me just read a couple of lines from here. He said, but now, right now, Starlink is very much a beta product and is unreliable, inconsistent, and foiled by even the merest suggestion of trees. Uh, in reality, it must be emphasized, is very irritating. Um, so the, as, as many listening to the show know, that it, going back a couple of years now, uh, we've been following this Starlink saga. This is this is a SpaceX attempt to make an a, a, a internet service provider uh, out of satellites, out of a constellation of thousands of satellites. Uh, could be in the neighborhood of 20,000 when they're all done. Um, but this piece is, I think, the piece to read for anyone interested in Starlink. And it's just an exceptional piece of journalism from someone who's covered like every single aspect of this 
particular, like there, I don't think there's anybody better suited to write about this other than uh, Neelai over there at, at The Verge. He's covered the technology. He's covered the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the regulation, everything on this over, over decades. And I, I think this is, this is probably uh, one, of, one of the best review that, that just, that I've read that really covers everything. He covers, he talks about the wonky modem that they provide all the way to the scientists that are just not happy about the night skies being clouded by, you know, thousands of satellites that block telescopes from viewing the far reaches of our cosmos. Um, so check this, check this um, out. I'm putting a link to it in our show notes over here um, at hometech.fm slash three, five, one. It's very much worth a weed. And uh, I, he also really blasts telecom, uh, providers in here, uh, especially here in the, in the States. Let me read a couple of lines here. And lastly, if you're a telecom executive or regulator in the United States, you have no choice but to see Starlink, its execution and its unrestrained excitement and hype around it as a direct indictment of your rhetoric and efforts to properly connect this country to the internet over the past two decades. Broadband on the ground is so wrapped up in lumbering BS of my, mo- monopolistic regulatory capture that it seems easier and more effective to literally launch rockets and try and building a network in the sky. (laughs) This is crazy. He's right. This is absolutely insane. He says Starlink isn't the result. uh, Sorry. Starlink isn't the happy end result of a commitment to facility based competition. It's thousands of middle fingers pointing at us from the air. It's what happens when there is an utter lack of competition. And I could not agree more. Please go read this article. It is absolutely amazing and gives you a really good idea of what Starlink is and what it can do and probably what it won't be able to do. All right. All right. Uh, big news from Savant. Savant has finally uh, re- announced the release of its Ring X line integration with Savant Pro app. Uh, last year, Savant and Ring announced a uh, strategic initiative where they would let Ring X line bundles be available to integrators through the Savant stores and also that they'd have an integration. Well, now with DaVinci 9.4, Savant has delivered on its promise to bring Ring integration uh, to the Savant home experience. Uh, The integration includes live view of all Ring video uh, within the Savant Pro app. Uh, Homeowner created notifications based on camera activations, uh, recorded video and clip playback, which is pretty cool, and the big one, two-way audio communications. So it's really cool. It's almost like you're using the Ring app within Savant. All in all, really great really great looking integration. I've had, <laughs> you know, I, I, Blackware, we developed uh, Control 4 integration years ago, and we've had similar initiatives under our belt for the past six years, but haven't been able to make much progress on them because uh, Ring does not move. <laughs> they say, here's our API, you use it, you know, if you can't use it, too bad. Uh, and then, you know, we're not first party like Savant, so we can't really con- change too much on the low level part of Control 4, URC, and on, that kind of thing, to rewrite their back in video code. And clearly, Savant thought it was a great idea to do this and uh, spent the time and effort. Uh, well, must have been pretty tough to do because it took them a, about a year to figure out how to how to put that together So um, and, and get it out into dealers' hands in, in mass. It's it's easy to show a one-off demo, as as you might do at a, at a dealer conference. It's a whole other thing to deploy it out to all of your installs and uh, not crash systems and check all the edge cases. So Savant's done a great job with this. I can speak from experience. This is not something that's easy to do. So kudos to the Savant team for making it happen. And if you aren't using Savant, check out our, you know, my integrations that we put together. We've got Control 4, Elan, URC, and coming to RTI. So um, check those out. We have those over at Blackwire. All right. <laughs> I'm sure Jason's going to see this. Uh, this video here and, and, and say, uh, thanks. Thanks for using the meme, Seth. <laughs> but I, I, I saw this story. It's pretty huge. One vision resources has launched new services designed to fill the resource gaps that many small and quite frankly, large integration companies wrestle with, uh, every day, uh, adding on to their service operations offering. The company is now providing HR and hiring services to help integrators with the H the hiring, like the entire hiring process, figuring out what roles and everything that you need all the way through the employment process. Just wow. Really cool. Really cool. Uh, they also are offering a new virtual CFO uh, service, which can help you with everything accounting wise, all the way from accounts receivable to payroll. So really cool that you can uh, sub a lot of this stuff out 
uh, as an integrator, I really wish that this had happened a long time ago. This is this is really cool to see coming from a company like One Vision, and and finally they also have a leadership development uh, service that they're going to be you know as part of being in One Vision that can help integrators grow and expand their business. Um, this sounds really awesome. I don't want to spend too much time on it because I, I know a guy and I probably can get him on the show uh, to tell us a little bit more. So uh, keep keep tuned in for that. And hopefully we'll get Jason on the show uh, to, to educate us a little bit more and, uh, and it, on, on what One Vision is able to offer these days. So AT&T has announced that it's spinning off its Warner Media division and merging with Discovery in a $43 billion deal. <laughs> the company uh, will pro- combine assets including Warner's film division, HBO Max, and the Discovery Plus streaming service, and putting it in a better position to compete with Netflix, Disney Plus, and other rivals. Uh, the agreement unites... Uh, here's, a, here's a quote from John Stankey, which we accidentally called him Stankey a long time ago on one of our, our shows because we can't pronounce names very well. But John Stankey, CEO of AT&T, said, This agreement unites two entertainment leaders with the complementary content of strengths and positions... Uh, the new company will uh, to be one of the leading global direct-to-consumer streaming platforms. So yeah, big deal. Uh, I'm sure this will only confuse uh, customers when HBO Max Ultra Plus Plus is announced in a couple weeks uh, to add on to the, all the HBO Max properties that AT&T has kind of pushed out over the last couple of years. All right. Um, Amazon is reportedly offering to buy M- film giant MGM for $9 billion. <laughs> If this deal goes through, Amazon would own James Bond, The Handmaid's Tale, Rocky, Stargate, Rogue Little Cop, Legally Bond, Vikings, and a massive catalog of films dating back decades. Uh, an array of production and distribution companies and the content network Epics. So these are all just rumors right now, but the fact that MGM has been up for sale since December 2020 and the news about AT&T spinning off Warner Media and combining with Discovery, we just talked about, would be pretty surprising if Amazon and MGL didn't make the deal. Um, so in December, Guardian reported that MGM has a library of 4,000 films and 17,000 hours of TV. So quite, quite the big, uh, quite the big buy if Amazon can pull it off. Could be fun. Could be fun to see all this. Uh, the streaming wars have begun, I guess they're still on. So hey, boring concert for $15. Here we go. A little late to the game. Spotify is entering the virtual concert business, just as in-person content concerts are becoming more of a possibility around the world. Uh, the company is set to announce, or the company announced that people can now buy tickets up to five different concert streams, which will air throughout May and June. Initial artists include the Black Eye, Black, uh, sorry, the Black Peas, uh, Jack Antoff, Bleachers, and Leon Bridges. Uh, the streams all are pre-recorded. Bleh. Uh, and only be viewed given t- uh, at, at a given time, specific time, through the web browser. It's, this seems like fail all over the place. Sorry. <laughs> the shows aren't available on demand, and they aren't, aren't, accept- aren't accessible through the Spotify app. So you can only watch this online in a browser on your laptop or iPad or something. I don't know. I think this idea would have been great if they had done it during the pandemic at minimum, but like, I don't know. This seems like they're missing the mark here on a couple of the technical issues. I think they should offer more avenues of viewing. The app is great. Why, why not throw them to the app? Uh, uh, why just the browser? It doesn't make any sense. I think $15 is a great price for some tickets, but I think they could also work to combine, you know, merch sales in there and, and, and you'd be able to buy, you know, t-shirts and that concert t-shirts and that kind of thing. Um, through the app as well. It'd be, it'd be really cool to see them do something like this. I, I just think there's more to be offered here. Um, and and I, I, I think you could actually do this live as well. Like restreaming the live streaming, the actual concert concerts with all the technology we have and everything that we have now, I think it'd be really cool to see some live stream concerts for the people who don't feel comfortable going out to concerts when they start picking back up, but also like adding in the element of the audience, uh, not only for the recording, but for um, for the band <laughs> themselves. I've seen a, a number of these uh, concerts done, and they're just not all that compelling without having that feedback from the audience. So I don't know. I, I'm a bit, I, I do like live concerts, um, and I, I think there's some technology. With the technology, we can do a lot better than, than this. $15 isn't so bad, though. 
or HBO Max News. HBO Max will launch an ad-supported tier in June for just $10 a month. It's offering a cheaper option than a full $15 per month ad-free subscription. The news was announced this uh, announced this week or last week, I'm not sure, during a Warner Media presentation for advertisers, and the price launch date were rumored last month. The streaming service, which has 64 million subscribers, has been planning an ad-supported tier uh, as a way to reach a wider audience, and the price makes it cheaper than the standard Netflix plan, but still costs more than Disney+. Plus. Hard to beat those guys. And HBO promises the lightest ad load in the industry, and, but it'll include a new ad format, so just pause ads. So this is interesting. You, you, when you press pause and get up and get a drink or whatever, you'll see an ad on the screen for something. Not necessarily, maybe it's moving. I don't know, maybe it's just a picture or something. It'll be interesting to see what that looks like. Um, ad-supported subscribers will get access to the full Ma- HBO Max content, um, but with one big exception, they won't be able to access the Warner Brothers, Warner Brothers movies that'll be premiering on the same day as like street and streaming as they're streaming in theaters. And we've talked about those deals in the past. So little couple of carved out exceptions here again, only to confuse customers and make them scratch their heads. Can't be easy, but uh, $10 for the HBO max access to HBO max. Not so bad. The ad free uh, ad supported service will launch first week of June in the U S followed by 39 countries across Latin America and the Caribbean uh, by the end of the month. And then Europe will take the longest reach, hopefully by the end of 2021. So we'll have to see how that goes. Eh? We were just talking today about gra- grabbing HBO Max back and paying for a subscription for a couple of uh, shows that will be coming out on it. So uh, we-, we canceled that one a while back, and uh, it's kind of been on the back burner. But yeah, maybe time to get back in. I'd probably pay five extra dollars for no ads, though. <laughs> All right. Um, big news from Apple this week. Apple's getting... Two, Apple Music is getting two big updates next month. Uh, support for high-quality lossless audio and for spatial audio through Dolby Atmos. All these features are going to be free to all subscribers, including those on family and student plans. The company says it'll have 75 million lossless audio songs in its catalog by the end of the year. 20 million to start. I saw a lot of press on this uh, over the last couple of days, and, and the rollouts just seems kind of awkward because... You really can't use the lossless audio if you're using, well, really any Apple product. <laughs> uh, you, I guess you could stream it out. You'd have to hook some kind of like USB device up that had the better DAX in it, but you won't be able to use the headphones. Headphones don't support it. Uh, and since we don't have a headphone jack out, there's really no way you can get the audio out of the, I don't know. It's just kind of awkward on how they, how they released lossless. In reality, lossless is just a checkbox. They're just playing catch up with companies like Tidal. I think Spotify was even offering something better. Um, it's just a checkbox on the feature list. So that's that's not what I'm excited about. I'm actually excited about the spatial audio stuff. And we're going to be talking about it a little bit on our Home Tech Talks this week. So if you're a supporter of the show, you have access to those. You can go to the Patreon page, hometech.fm slash support, get you a link over there. Log into that and you can get the link to uh, join our Home Tech Talks where we're going to talk about spatial audio and what that can mean for our industry uh, and how how we're going to pull this off. Back to Apple. The spatial audio stuff is amazing. The idea behind spatial audio, we've talked about Dolby Atmos. Eh, uh, every now and then we've talked about Dolby Atmos, just kind of brought it up. It's kind of like the new big thing, right? But spatial audio is a big part of what you can do with stuff like Dol- Dolby Atmos. And, and what it gives you as a... If I was mixing the music, it gives you beds that you can mix into. So you get a 5.1 bed, a 7.1 bed, whatever. Uh, and you can take the audio, and say the guitar sound, and treat that as an object. And you place that object in a virtual room. And then it's up to the receiver, or in this case, the Apple headphones that, that, that Apple would be streaming those the, the sounds to, to decode those sounds and 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 build them up within a sound stage the a virtual sound stage it gives you more much more immersion than than uh, stereo so think of a stereo as like when you have stereo audio you can hear hard pan hard le- left and right but the, the audio still feels like it's in your head like you still kind of feel that way when you listen to stereo audio atmos and and spatial audio is going to be outside of your head be it's going to feel like you're in a room listening to this music and a, a couple of providers were already doing i think title was already doing this um and, and had some really positive reviews on it. I think this is going to be big. And I think it's, it's, it, this type of uh, listening is going to be interesting 
um, moving into the future. Cause I think this is really, what's going to separate a lot of like so, a lot of things, uh, music wise, it's going to separate a lot of the things, uh, for, for consumers who are actually able to utilize and use this stuff. And they're going to expect that they're, you know, $129 or $200, $200, $250 headphones that they pick up. Uh, you know, they're going to expect that they're, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 systems in their house sound the same thing. So same way, uh, and can, and can have match the same features. So it will be interesting to see how our industry, uh, prepares for that and, and gets into it with, with everything being done this way. Um, Immersive mixes will be available on AirPods, Beats headphones that use the H1 or W1 chip. And the spatial audio will also play through built-in speakers on, I mean, who cares? <laughs> it's, that's just a dumb way of doing it, but whatever. Uh, you can turn it on on your headphones. Uh, I think you have to go to the music app in settings. You go to settings, music, audio, and set Dolby Atmos to always on. And the spatial audio will be compatible with most, most Apple devices made in the last few years, including the Apple TV 4K connected to a compatible TV or receiver. So that's always the fun part, finding a receiver or a TV that can do Atmos. Um, these days it's kind of tough because there's no inventory. We just, we don't have them. So, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, let's see. I think that's the last one. So all the links and topics we discussed tonight can be found in the show notes at over at hometech.fm slash 351. And don't forget, you can join us live in the chat room. Uh, starting sometime between 7 and 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can find out how to do that at hometech.fm slash live. Or following us on Twitter, I usually tweet out, hey, we're going live, and give you kind of the same link there, too. Pick of the week. Got a great pick of the week. I need to bring this back up. Uh, let's see, pick of the week. Cable is here. This is really cool, guys. <laughs> I have, I'm really impressed with this. Uh, tell me what you think. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read it. I'm just going to read this because it's a great press release from this company here. And it, it, the company is called Cable. It's a K-A-Y-B-L. And this is a new service that bundles your favorite content for one flat monthly fee. All that garbage we talked about earlier about HBO, it doesn't matter. So here's what they say in their, their, their press release here. Let's face it, streaming is broken. Content constantly disappears from your favorite platforms. New services pop up every day and each streamer comes in with confusing variety of pricing options. And we, we just reviewed that. So that's why we've created a brand new service that bundles all your favorite content into one flat monthly fee called, here we go, cable. Our service is different from those old school digital content providers. Thanks to our patented browsing channel, uh, uh, browsing system called channels. That's with a Z and it's trademarked. Pretty cool. Our content is constantly looping on thousands of numbered streams that operate 24 seven. That's right. No more having to type out all the letters in the marvelous Miss Maisel uh, one by one. Uh, no, you don't have to do that or use a voice recognition remote that misinterprets one division as one division with cable searching for shows is simple. Uh, <laughs> thanks to their, now this is cool. They, they have this new feature called G Y D and I think it's pronounced guide. Uh, it's a state of the art search engine that displays all of the content on cable on a single grid organized by channel number and time of day. This is amazing. This is amazing. So, uh, it says say goodbye to, uh, to trying to remember which streaming service offers little fires everywhere. Uh, say goodbye to that, getting that op, that trial of Apple TV, just a wide Ted lasso and, uh, say goodbye to forgetting the family Netflix password and having to call your dad and figure out what it is. And your dad doesn't text back right away. So you call him. And, uh, but now he wants to catch up since it's been a while since you last talked. And then you finally get around to asking him for the password. He nags you about the fact that you're still in the family phone plan, even though you're 30 and married. And so now you're going to have to spend the rest of the night looking on how to switch to T-Mobile. Instead, you can join the millions of cord adders. That's pretty cool. They, they have a whole thing about this. Uh, who are ditching streamer, streaming for the service where everything is included at one flat rate. There you go. <laughs> This is brilliant. I will link to this. They go on and on in this story here uh, and and have so many more great jokes about cable. Um, but I, I, it, it's it's so well written. I just had to put it in for the uh, for the for the pick of the week this week. Uh, it is just too good. So. <laughs> All right. Um, if you have any feedback, comments, uh, picks of the week or great ideas for the show, give us a shout. Email address is feedback at hometech.fm. Or you can visit hometech.fm slash feedback and fill out the online form. 
I do want to thank everyone who supports the show, but especially those who are able to financially support the show through our patron page. If you don't know about our patron page, head on over to hometech.fm slash support to learn how you can support Home Tech for as little as a dollar a month. Any pledge over five bucks a month gets you a big shout out on the show, but every pledge gets you an invite to our private Slack chat, The Hub, and uh, where you can get you know news before it happens because... Uh, I can tell you the Snap AV stuff, that news broke a little bit earlier in the hub than it did anywhere else. And uh, yeah, yeah, the hub, that's where that's where you got to go. And it also gets you access to the Home Tech Talks, both the recorded versions and you can join us live uh, when we have those typically on Thursdays around 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, maybe 3.30. I'm not sure. But if you join, uh, you go into the, the, the final link to join those and uh, you, you you'll have access to them. You can, it's just basically a Zoom webinar and it'll remind you just like it reminds me when it's supposed to be. So uh, if you want to help out but can't sh- support the show financially, totally understand. Just appreciate a five-star review on iTunes or positive rating in the podcast app of your choice. And with that, it wraps up another week of two weeks <laughs> of home technology news. I am exhausted. Now, I'm going to have to take another vacation, but that was a lot to cover <laughs> uh, in, the, in, the, in the last two weeks. Um, crazy news. Well, I'm sure there's going to be more on Snap EV and then what they're doing uh, to go public. Uh, I'm, it's not a, it's not a, like, uh, they, they've got to basically show their books to everybody. And I, I think that'll be interesting for the industry to see how, I would say, one of the largest, or if not the largest provider of uh, equipment and and services maybe um, into the industry is doing financially and what they see uh, as uh, you know in there you have to put risks uh, in, into the industry you know one of them I, I remember control four had in there is like a risk here's a risk as an example housing is kind of a fickle thing and if housing if the housing market goes down then a lot of the profit from Control 4 would go down. So I imagine we'll see something like that written in, but I'm very curious to see what Snap AV considers risks to investing in their company um, because they're going to have to put that uh, before they go public. So anyway, uh, that wraps up this week. And uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Eddie, for joining in the the chat over there. We appreciate you guys adding to the show. And um, yeah, thanks for listening. And we'll talk to you next week. 